stand up and maybe greet the people beside you, around you, before we get started. So as you guys stay standing, uh, we'll, we'll read uh, the call to passage. The call to passage. No? Okay. Um, okay, let's, oh, okay, there it is. Okay. Ephesians 5, 1 to 2. Therefore be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us a fragrant offering and sacrifice to God. So please remain standing as we... Um, start off our worship um, by singing praises to him. Shining on 
Take my hands and let them move at the end of Sunday. Take my feet and let them be swift and Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning. As we sing, may it be what truly resonates in our, in our souls, Lord. That for those who follow you this morning, may that be the cry for you to take our lives. May it be for you and you alone, for your glory and your praise. We stand as redeemed people, saved by the blood of your Son, brought out of death into life, renewed and restored, so we can live lives that can be for your glory and for your praise. You've made us new. You've given us new hearts. You've renewed our minds, new ambitions, new passions, new loves. And Lord, this morning we come before you with hearts eagerly to worship you. We thank you, Lord, that you have given us this opportunity to gather again this morning as we are able to sing to you, hear your word preached, and also pray as well. 
Lord, we pray for our state today. We pray for the atrocities that we have seen this last week, week and a half. Lord, we pray for the families um, in the San Gabriel Valley that's been affected by the shootings. As our hearts grieve, as it hits close to home for so many of us, we pray for the families that have lost loved ones. We pray for the churches in the Los Angeles areas. We pray for the Chinese churches and Asian American churches um, to be able to rally around the hurt and the people who are crying in desperation. May your people be in the front lines in care and in love. Lord, we long to know and our hearts continues to cry out, wanting to know why, Lord, but I pray that even in the midst of great anguish, we can learn to trust in you and rest in you and long for your son's return. And Lord, we also want to pray for the families affected in the Half Moon Bay shooting. Just another tragedy after another in our, in our home, Lord where it affects probably the hearts of many here as well. And I pray for their families also. And Lord, I pray for us as a church in the Bay Area, how we can continue to love and pray and support and comfort, Lord. As many of us are struggling with understanding and confronting once again the realities of, of sin. So, Lord, we pray for wisdom for our leaders once again on how to best respond and react. I pray for hearts of contriteness and brokenness and humility, Lord, as your followers, as we learn to follow you and trust you, knowing that you are truly sovereign and good, that you comfort May our hearts long for your son to return. We also want to lift up um, just law enforcement, Lord, as more things are happening in our nation, and more things revealed, especially in what happened in Memphis, Lord. We pray for officers with humility and love and a desire to serve their community. We pray against um, we pray against people who long for power, who serve themselves. We pray against any corruption and the sins that uh, we've seen time and time again, Lord. And Lord, we we pray for the city of Memphis. We pray for the communities there feeling another sense of broken trust. Lord, we long for justice. We long for... We long for, for... for people that will serve and protect, Lord. And we know, Lord, that you have called believers into that arena and area, Lord, and I pray that they would be there for your good and bring about your gospel in that area, but we also know, Lord, that there are um, sin that prevails in those areas of life as well. And Lord, we pray for justice there. We pray for wisdom. We pray for discernment. We pray for your believers to um, deeply long after you in those moments to trust you, to sit in attention and call for you, and ultimately, the Lord, our cry time and time again is, come, Lord Jesus, come. We pray for the preaching this morning. We pray for Minister Theo. We thank you for the work he has put this week in preparing and exegeting your word. I pray that you give us hearts of clarity to receive your word, that you give us hearts of flesh to humble ourselves, to come before you. May you give us eyes to see 
ears to hear, hearts to receive your word. And Lord, I pray that as your people, we will respond to you today. We thank you for hearing our prayers. We thank you and humbled and awed that the God of the universe tunes into us. And as we pray, may you be glorified. May you be honored today. We pray all this in your son's name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. Have a seat. Welcome. My name is Dennis. I am one of the mem- uh, one of, I am one of the members here at Vinewood and at Chinese for Christ Berkeley. I am also one of the pastors here as well. If this is your first time, uh, I want to be the one of the first people to um, welcome you. Thank you for uh, coming and visiting. Uh, you should have received a physical get welcome card from one of our welcome team members at the door today. We ask that you just please fill out that card and just return it to one of the team members after service. This is just a way for us to get to know you a little bit better. Uh, You will not get spammed with emails, but we do want to connect with you. And so if you would uh, do us a kind favor, uh, just uh, give us an opportunity to maybe answer any of your questions or maybe get connected, uh, help help you get connected to any of the small groups or fellowships here at church. Uh, If you are joining us online, this is our last week. But we do invite you that there is an online Get Connected Google form on our website. And so uh, feel free to uh, fill that out as well. We will be kicking off our spring evangelism class, Becoming Fishers of Men, next week, uh, Sunday, February 5th. And we are going to be in classroom 202. And so it's going to be right here, uh, 202. And it's the big room on that side. And so there will be five sessions long. It's going to end on April 9th. And so there will be a mix of lectures. There's going to be a sharing of the gospel inside and outside of church and uh, with feedback and also a skit. And so our deacon, Richard Liu, will be teaching that class. And so we are very excited for that. And if you uh, are interested in getting more equipped on how to share the gospel, I think as, all, as believers we know that we should and long to share the gospel, but maybe we don't feel comfortable knowing how to. Uh, I want to encourage you to take that class. If you are a in youth, one of the Agape youth students, our Sunday school will be in the organ room on the other side. So you get the brand new room, which is, I think, like literally like right up there. So if you go on the other side, there's going to be another staircase, and you get those brand new rooms, and the uh, class, your Sunday school class will be there. If you have any questions about any of those things, you reach out to me or you can reach out to Deacon Richard. If you are interested in getting baptized for our, um, on April 2nd, which will be the week before Easter, uh, we will be beginning baptism class on February 12th, so the week after the evangelism class. Uh, there will be five consecutive classes uh, for us, uh, for you, and it will be from 11.15, or it will meet at 11.15. It's going to be in room 201, so it is the room closest to the staircase right next to the evangelism class. So maybe if you're interested in both of them, if you just kind of like listen closely, you might be able to get both of them at the same time. Um, and so go ahead, and if you're interested in getting baptized, there will be classes there. And the fifth class is actually a membership class on March 12th. So for those who are getting baptized, we do highly, highly encourage you to take the membership class as well. And then for those who have already been baptized, perhaps maybe at your home church, uh, we would encourage you to go to the membership class on March 12th so you can just sit in on that last class. Um, We also hold prayer meetings every morning at 8 a.m. before Sunday service, and it is in room 202, again, that big room. It is the most utilized room because it is one of our largest rooms, and so uh, at 8 a.m., you can meet us there for prayer meeting. There's also a Zoom link available online. And if you have offering or uh, this morning, we encourage you to give via Zelle Pay or PayPal, and you can find that online on our website in the Give tab, and uh, you can get more information on how to do that there. Again, I want to remind everybody who, not here, but those who maybe are tuning in online, this is the last Sunday that we'll have Zoom Sunday service live stream. So after this Sunday, if you are online right now, we're very glad that you're with us. 
but we'll be even more glad to see you in person next week. And so we will be ending our live stream service uh, because we do see, one, I think uh, as we've seen COVID continue to Progress is not the right word, but I guess uh, as, as things are opening up more and more and more and life is kind of going back to a semblance of normalcy, uh, we think that it's actually quite vital for our spiritual lives to gather in person together. So we want to encourage those to be able to join us. We want to thank our tech team who worked so hard behind the scenes to make this happen over the course of the pandemic for years. Uh, and that's been a great blessing for all of us during that time but also for those who were able to, who were unable to come. So we want to thank them as well. Uh, the re- uh, recordings, uh, the sermon recordings will be posted on our YouTube channel uh, each week. So if, say, you missed a Sunday, uh, maybe you're traveling and you want to kind of catch up or you want to re-listen uh, to Minister Theo's, uh, one of his amazing sermons, you can always go back and go online. We'll post it online and you can listen to that again. And so finally, I want to remind everybody that there will be some church, uh, we're going to be mounting TVs at our church today at 1 p.m. to 1.30 p.m. And if you want to stick around and help out, please contact our deacon, Victor Zhao, who is currently in the back. And uh, hopefully you'll be ready for that. You'll get some instructions, but we'll be happy to have your help. Uh, But last but not least, we want to invite Minister Theo up as he continues us in the book of Matthew. Only 5'4", and had a little bit of leg hair, a little bit of armpit hair, and I was like, I am ahead of the curve. I am here on God's green earth to play basketball. The next year, sixth grade, got my second growth spurt. By that time, I was 5'7", as an 11-year-old. I made the team at my elementary school. We were a K through 6 elementary school. And I was like, I'm ready. I'm here. I already get dominated. And I realized very quickly when I got on the court that I was only effective for the first minute because the other team was afraid of me because they saw this like random Chinese kid who's like five, seven as an 11 year old and they're like, what is going on? What is he? But the thing is, the minute they saw me touch the ball, they realized I was useless. I couldn't dribble, I couldn't really catch well, I could not get the reads that I should have and most importantly, I could not shoot. I could get up to the paint, I could never make it in. And I would always ask people like, how do you shoot? Like, what do you do? And they're like, just shoot it. I'm always like, that was the least helpful advice you could ever give, just shoot it. Just do it, just put it up. And throughout my life, I've been very sensitive to the phrase, just do this, just do that. When we use the word just, we trivialize things. We make them seem easier. We reduce them. When we use the word just, we are implying, bro, you just suck. We also imply that we don't understand the complexity of what we're saying. We don't understand that shooting a basketball, this is me kind of excusing myself and rationalizing, right? But we don't understand that shooting a basketball actually has a lot of physiological mechanics. It has to start from your feet, up through your legs, through your arms, the way that your fingers are shaped, the motion of your hand, the stability of everything. Like I'm saying things that I just read off a PDF and they make sense to me. There's mechanics behind these things. There's a reason for things. There's a reason why some people shoot better than others, not just because of their bodily giftings, but because they've trained, because they studied. In the same way, I think as Christians, we do a disservice when we trivialize Christian love. Very often when you talk to an average Christian on the street, you'll ask them what's Christianity about, and they'll say, oh, just love God and love people. Just love God and love people. 
But for those of us here today who have seriously tried to love God, I think you and I would agree that it is very, very hard to love God. That it is not natural for us to do so. Instead, it's natural for us to love sin. So we recognize that it takes everything that we have and more to love God. In the same way that for those of us who have tried to love one another, loving one another is much harder than we make it out to be. Because we know that Christian love is not just sentiment. Christian love is commitment. Christian love is action. It is sacrifice. So when we talk about Christian love this morning, In Matthew 25, verse 31 to 46, I want to unload it on you. I want to show you the full depth from what Jesus is saying here at the end of the Olivet Discourse of how important our love is. The title for today is to love your king by loving his people, and that's also the main point. This is the last section of the Olivet Discourse. Jesus has finished telling us what is the end going to be like? How will we know when he comes back? What should we do in the meantime? How should the knowledge that Jesus is returning shape the way that we live today? And this is the last section. Jesus is going to tell us one more thing about how his second coming has to shape our lives today. With that said, please look with me at Matthew 25, verse 31, and I'll read, and we will thank God for his word after. Jesus says, When the Son of Man comes in his glory, and all the angels with him, Then he will sit on his glorious throne. Before him will be gathered all the nations, and he will separate people from one another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And he will place the sheep on his right, but the goats on his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungry, and you gave me food. I was thirsty, and you gave me drink. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. I was naked, and you clothed me. I was sick, and you visited me. I was in prison, and you came to me. Then the righteous will answer him, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you a drink? And when did we see you a stranger and welcome you, or naked and clothe you? And when did we see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will answer them, Truly, I say to you, as you did it to one of these, the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. Then he will say to those on his left, depart from me, you cursed, into the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was hungry and you gave me no food. I was thirsty and you gave me no drink. I was a stranger and you did not welcome me, naked and you did not clothe me, sick and in prison and you did not visit me. Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? And then Jesus will answer them, saying, Truly, I say to you, as you did not do it to one of the least of these, you did not do it to me. And these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. This is the word of the Lord. Let's pray together before we continue. God, we rely on you this morning to guide us by your spirit. Help us to understand what you are saying through your word to each of us. In your son's name we pray. Amen. I want to spend our time in four points. I want to unpack the significance of what I'm saying is the main idea of this passage, which is that we have to take care to love our king, Jesus, by loving his people. And the first point is, as you'll see on the screen, Love is our identity marker. Love is our identity marker. What we see in verse 31 is that Jesus will judge. Jesus is the judge that we will all stand before on the last day. Jesus is pointing to that last day, that final day, when all the nations, verse 32, will be gathered in front of him. This is the final universal judgment. Jesus is speaking of that day when every single one of us will have to give an account of how we have lived our lives, whether good or evil, whether by faith or without. Jesus was given the right to judge because God wanted to win glory for his son. We see this in John chapter 5. Jesus explains the father actually will not be the judge. Because the Father has given the Son the right to judge because he wants all people to honor his Son. So Jesus will judge for his glory. You look later in Revelation, you see that the book of life belongs to Jesus. In chapter 3, Jesus has the right to blot someone's name out of the book of life. 
when Jesus sits on the great white throne to judge in Revelation 20, it is he who has the book of life in front of him. So the first thing that we have to come to terms with this morning, friends who sit with me today, are you ready? Are you ready to stand before Jesus and give an account of your life? We have to recognize that it is not anything that we can do that can make us worthy. It is not any performance that we could muster out of ourselves, no amount of moral living that could make us worthy to stand in front of Jesus and say, I deserve to be with you. I deserve to be welcomed into heaven. But instead, we recognize that the one who is to judge us is also the one who came down to save us. The one who has all right to judge is the same one who humbled himself to become like a servant, who gave himself on the cross for you and me so that whoever would believe should not perish but have eternal life. This is the judge. We have no excuse in front of this judge. None of us can say we didn't know because I just told you that if you have not yet put your faith in Jesus, you need to do so today because unless you do, you will not be ready to stand before him in the judgment. Jesus uses an analogy here to describe how he's going to judge. In verse 32, he tells us he is going to be like a shepherd. In the same way that a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats, Jesus also will separate the righteous from the wicked. And we have to ask, how can he tell us apart? What's well, our love that distinguishes us? It is our love that sets us apart. We have to understand first that sheep and goats actually look very similar. In the nation era's culture, especially if you were an Israelite back in the day, a lot of times if you were a shepherd, you would have both sheep and goats. And the problem is for us as Western people growing up in California, most of us, we have never seen a sheep in our lives. And we just think, oh, the ones that show up in children's book, the white fluffy ones are sheep. When in actuality, sheep come in all shades from white to black, including brown. In the same way that goats also come in all colors from white through black, including brown. In the same way that some sheep are really ugly and other goats are very cute and vice versa. They actually look very similar. So if you're just looking at a crowd of a hundred sheep and goats, honestly, you and I could probably not pick them apart. It takes a trained eye to be able to distinguish which one's a sheep, which one's a goat. The point of this analogy that Jesus is making is sheep and goats lived together. They did things together. They ate the same things. They drank the same things. They walked around in large flocks together. They're virtually indistinguishable. And in the same way, when it comes to us as people, how different are we? Like, if we were purely monastic, then yeah, you could tell which one's a Christian and which one's not, because all the Christians hole up in monasteries and they spend their time eating beans and praying. That's not how we are. We are in this world. We walk among non-Christians. Most of your classmates are non-Christians. Most of your co-workers are non-Christians. My co-workers are Christian. Ha <laughs> ha. So you can, it's, you, it's indistinguishable. You can't tell people apart just by looking at them. So in the same way, Jesus is saying, it takes a trained eye to discern who is the righteous and who is the wicked. And what Jesus is going to teach us is that as the judge and as the king who knows us in verse 34, it is our love that distinguishes us. That is what separates the sheep from the goats, the righteous from the wicked. Just at a quick glance from verses 34 to 40, if you just glance at it, you see a picture of very practical love. It is a very practical love. It is the only criterion used for judgment. Because Christian love is the fundamental and summary proof of faith. That is to say, you cannot possibly believe if you don't have Christian love. You cannot possibly be a believer if you do not love your brothers and sisters in a practical way. James tells us in James chapter 2 verse 17 that faith without works is dead. So you cannot have faith if you don't have the works that show that you have faith. It's often said that we are saved by faith alone, but saving faith is never alone. It is love that proves our faith. In the same way that Paul says in Romans 13, that you should owe no one anything except to love them. So I'm not saying that love saves you. 
Faith saves you. But you cannot possibly be saved if you do not love. And that's what we see in 1 John 4. He who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot possibly love God whom he has not seen. It is impossible for you to say that you are a believer if your life does not show love for the king's people. Notice in verse 40 that Jesus limits this scope. A lot of people abuse this passage. They use it to guilt trip people to say that you have to love the least of these, the entire world, every single person that's needy. Notice that Jesus says in verse 40, Truly I say to you, as you did it to one of the least of these, my brothers, you did it to me. He limits it. Our obligation is to our brothers and sisters. Our obligation is to God's people. This is not to say that this is exclusive of people who are not Christians. That's not the point. The point is that Christians take priority. Remember Jesus says in John 13 that by this the world, that you, the world will know that you are my disciples by your love for one another. And Paul says in Galatians chapter 6, love everyone, do good for everyone, but especially for the household of God. There is a priority here. Jesus is holding us accountable for the way that we treat one another in the church first. Our love for people outside of the church comes second. Think about it like this. If you cannot love the brother and sister who sits next to you, how can you possibly love the people outside of God's family? If you cannot love the people whom God has redeemed, how can you possibly love the people that are still outside of your family? The church is the training ground. The church is the place where we hone our skills. The church is the place where we get to figure out how to love people. And then we take what we learned here and apply it outside. Do not mistake your priorities. You're trying to run before you can even walk. Christian love is not only sentiment. Christian love is not only words, it's not only feelings. Christian love is action. Look with me in verses 35 and 36. Just glance at it. Notice the way that Jesus puts forward real, practical, tangible needs. Hunger, thirst, being a stranger, unwelcomed, having not even clothes, being sick, being in prison. In New Testament times, these things were actually very prevalent. These things were actually not Uncommon. These are things that we can't even imagine in here in Berkeley, really the rest of California, really the rest of the United States. We can't even imagine it here. But this is more commonplace than you would think. Let me use the prison system as the primary example. In our, I'm not saying that I agree with incarceration policies, things like that. That's not the point of this morning. What I am saying is that in a U.S. prison, you have clothes, you have food, you have water, you have some level of leisurely activity. In the Roman prison system, you had nothing. You were not promised bread. You were not promised water. You were not promised reasonable temperatures in your cell. You can consider Paul at the end of his life. In 2 Timothy chapter 4, he says, he writes to Timothy, and bring my cloak. Paul was freezing in his prison cell. Paul was cold. The guards had no obligation to take care of him. The prison system was different back then. Paul's own experience in prison paints a vivid picture for us to understand that when Jesus says, you visited me in prison, he is saying, you met my needs because no one else will. Unless you go out of your way to visit a brother or sister who is in prison, they are not guaranteed food or clothing or any other basic necessity. That is how the prison system worked. So what Jesus is speaking to here is very basic needs. And again, we are painting the picture that love is absolutely necessary. See what 1 John says, 1 John chapter 3, if anyone has the world's goods and sees his brother in need and yet closes his heart against him, how does God's love abide in him? That is to say, if you see a need and you refuse to meet it, you're probably not saved. If you see a need, you have the means to meet the need, and you choose not to meet it. You choose to close your heart against your brother or your sister. John says, you're probably not saved. Why is 
practical Christian love. So important, Jesus. Second point, Jesus identifies with us. Jesus identifies with his people. We have to ask, why did Jesus choose this wording? Whatever you did to the least of these, my brothers, you did to me. In what sense does me being kind to one of you function as me being kind to Jesus? Jesus identifies with his people. And I want to take you through what I'm going to call a biblical theology of identification. I want to show you how this idea of identification spells out as we go through scripture in three sections. First, God made us in his image. See, the thing is, God has always taken us personally. God has always taken the way that we treat one another personally. You see in Genesis chapter 9, verse 6, you can go to the next slide. We'll come back to each of these, don't worry. Whoever sheds the blood of man, by man shall his blood be shed, for God made man in his own image. God takes it personally when one man kills another man, when a woman kills another woman. God takes it personally because God made this person in his own image. And so there is a real penalty on earth in anticipation of the eternal penalty for taking someone else's life. That's the negative side. But on the positive side, Proverbs 19 says this, whoever is generous to the poor lends to the Lord and he, God, will repay him for his deed. In the same way that God takes evil against another human personally, God also takes good toward another person personally. What Jesus is saying here is not a new idea. God has always taken the way that we treat one another personally. This is Old Testament. Now let's move on. Hebrews chapter 2. Let's talk about New Testament. In the same way that it starts with God making us in his image, we see that Jesus was made to be like us. God made us in his image. But the next step in identification is Jesus was made to be like us. See what the author says. Therefore, he, Jesus, had to be made like his brothers in every respect so that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make propitiation for the sins of his people. Jesus was made like us. He knows the law's heavy burden of loving unlovely people. Jesus knows how hard it is to love people who will not love you back. Jesus knows how, how thankless love can be. Consider how Jesus loved those who crucified him. Think of how in Luke's gospel, as he was hanging on the cross, he prays for the soldiers' sake, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. When he was most tempted to hate others, to hate the people who were killing him, he chose to love them instead. Jesus knows the full extent of how hard it is to love someone. And because of that, he can be merciful toward us when we struggle with the same. He knows the full weight of that burden. God made us in his image. Jesus was made to be like us. And now the last step, Jesus has united himself to us. Jesus has united himself to us. He's in John chapter 17, verse 26. After his ascension, that is to say, after Jesus died, was raised, and went up to sit at the right hand of God the Father in a profound way that it is honestly impossible for us to understand. Jesus is in us, and we are in him. Jesus says in John chapter 17, I made known to them your name, Father, and I will continue to make it known that the love with which you have loved me may be in them and I in them. This is the climax of identification. God no longer takes things personally at a distance. God takes things personally as he lives in us. This is the trajectory of this idea. This is why Jesus can say, whatever you do to one another, you do to me. Jesus does not identify us, identify with us at a distance. He identifies with each one of us because he lives in you, believer. So what we have to understand is what we do to one another, we do to him. What you and I do to one another, we do to him. So think about the immense worth of the good that you do for one another. Think about the immense worth of how 
good your kindness is, how valuable it is to Jesus, when you go out of your way for one another, you do it for him. When you are considerate toward one another, you do it for him. When you are generous toward one another, you do it to him. But also consider the gravity of the wrong that you do toward one another. If you hate one another, you hate him. If you resent one another, you resent him. If you are bitter, if you slander, if you gossip, you do it to him. Consider that it's not just what you do, but what you leave undone. If you neglect to love your brother or sister next to you, you neglect to love your king. This is why it's so important that we love our king by loving his people. We cannot possibly say that we love Jesus, that we are one of his, if we do not first love his people. Third, Jesus will reward his own. Jesus will reward his own. Look at me in verse 34. It says, Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Consider the fact that you were saved to receive this kingdom. This is the culmination of your salvation. This is God's plan for you. All this time, he was to save you so that you would receive this kingdom, so that you would reign with his son, as we talked about last Sunday. One commentator says that this new status is not an afterthought. It's the culmination of God's purpose for you since the foundation of the world. This has always been God's plan. Consider how Jesus was humbled for a little while so that he would be exalted eternally, as the author of Hebrews says. And the thing is, really the mind-blowing thing about God is he does the same thing for us. He calls us to be humbled for a little while so that we can receive a heavenly kingdom that cannot be shaken. I cannot explain this generosity to you. How can it be that God should grant us to reign with his son? How is it that you and I, who require a very strong back to carry us, We can't do anything. How is it that God should reward us simply for believing in his son, simply for living by faith day by day? Why is it that we who can bear no fruit of our own for his kingdom should be rewarded? This is God's generosity. When God calls us to humble ourselves, to lay down our little kingdoms for just a little while because of the promise that he will give us something greater, something eternal, something that will never perish and never fade, where moth and rust cannot destroy, this is God's generosity. God saved us to be generous to us. And you will never outdo God in generosity. Consider that your efforts to love are not in vain. Your efforts to love are not in vain. The things that you have to sacrifice in order to love your brothers and sisters are never in vain because you did it for Jesus. So I want to challenge you to consider what love requires. It requires intention and sacrifice. So let me ask you first, are your eyes open? Are your eyes open to needs? Are your eyes open toward one another, or are you wearing blinders so that you can only see what you want to see? Do you tunnel vision on the little kingdom that you're trying to build, or are your eyes open to see the kingdom that God is building in our midst right now as he makes each and every one of us like his son? Open your eyes to see the needs that are in front of you, to see the kingdom opportunities that God is giving to each one of you. Open your eyes, and when you see the need, open your hearts Because if you see the need and close your heart toward your brother or sister, you're closing your heart to Jesus. If you see the need, open your heart and meet the need. I want to challenge you this morning. Don't calculate. Don't calculate the sacrifice. If you see a need and your heart is open toward that need, just meet it. Don't do the math in your head. Don't say, well, I need at least two hours and 19 minutes to study for my midterm, and this is going to cost me two hours and 21 minutes, so I'm sorry, I can't do it. Don't calculate. If you are calculating how much you can sacrifice, let me suggest that you are not sacrificing at all. 
You're just like a Pharisee. The Pharisees who will tithe the little things like cumin and mint and dill, but they neglect the weightier matters of the law, like love and justice and mercy. If you calculate your sacrifice, you are not loving, you're just being obligated. You're just living a life of, oh, my mom told me I have to, so I will. That's not love. Open your eyes to the least of these. Open your eyes to the people in our church who do not get attention. Open your eyes to the people in our church who are not popular. Open your eyes to the people in our church who are quietly hurting. These are the people that you and I must work to care for. I want to say one more time. The reason why I'm saying and the reason why the New Testament says to prioritize your love for the church is because the church is our training ground. This is where we start. This is where we learn the skills. This is where we see God's grace at work in us and through us. And as we develop a better culture of love and care in our church, every single one of us will be better equipped to go out and love and care for other people. Because when you learn the depths of Christian love in the church context, you will understand the depth of sacrifice and the level of commitment that it takes to love like Jesus is calling us to love. Not just a sentiment, not just a fluffy idea, not just love, but to take on the full burden and commitment that Christian love requires. Do this knowing that however much you have to sacrifice to love one of your brothers and sisters, you will never outdo the God who sacrificed his son for you. Never. You will never outdo God in generosity. Do this, lastly, because Jesus will reject all others. Let me say one more time. You are not saved because you love. We are saved by faith alone, but saving faith is never alone. Saving faith loves, if I may put it like that. Love is the summary expression of saving faith. They're not condemned for lack of love per se. They're condemned for the lack of real saving faith. And one more note. I want to keep in mind Jesus' audience. Remember who Jesus is talking to. The function of this passage is not universal condemnation. You're not supposed to go to a random non-Christian that you're trying to share the gospel with and say, hey, look, because you don't care about the least of these, you're going to hell. That's not the point. Jesus is not speaking to outsiders. Jesus is speaking to his disciples. This is a warning to us in this room not to be used against people who do not profess to be Christians. This is a warning for those who call themselves disciples. Take care, then, to not neglect love. Do not neglect love. Again, just at face value, at a quick glance, you can see that it's mirrored. It's almost a copy and paste from the previous section, except it's abbreviated. But there's one thing that stands out. I want to point this to you. Look with me in verse 44. This is the response that the, I'm going to call them goats, give. Verse 44, Then they also will answer, saying, Lord, when did we see you hungry or thirsty or a stranger or naked or sick or in prison and did not minister to you? The Greek word behind minister, minister is um, it's too fancy of a word. It's actually a very mundane word. It's actually a very humble word. It literally just means to serve. When did we not serve you? This is the same word that Matthew puts in Jesus' mouth in Matthew chapter 20, when Jesus says, the greatest of you will be the servant of all. In the same way that the Son of Man came not to be served, but to serve. It's the same Greek word. When we see this verbal link, we have to understand Jesus is using basic discipleship terminology. This is ground-level faith. When these people say, when did we not serve you? Remember that we are in an American Christian context. 
we have this idea that service is good. Service is noble. Ministry is something to be lauded and applauded. But the thing is, back in the day, to use the word diakoneo, to serve, it was a humble word. No person of stature serves. No person of dignity or reputation serves. You know who serves? Servants serve. Jesus has been calling his disciples to humble themselves, to lay down their kingdoms, to lay down their pursuit of respect and dignity, and just to serve. In the same way, we have to understand what Jesus is saying. He is calling us towards something humble and undesirable, something that should win you no praise whatsoever, something that should humble you. It is their unwillingness to serve fellow believers because they were unwilling to serve one another. They refused to serve Jesus himself. One commentator says that the fault of the cursed is not so much that they have done wrong, but instead that they have failed to do right. They chose not to serve the king. So they're rebels. And Jesus ends by saying that your present neglect will cost you your eternity. Quote, unquote, disciples who neglect the humble, sacrificial love that Jesus commands. People who claim to be disciples who refuse to serve the king will be cursed by God, verse 41, and share the same fate as the devil and his angels. Jesus calls it here in verse 46, eternal punishment. The curse of God for these people is, I'm going to say it very clearly, eternal punishment. Now we have to ask, why is it so disproportionate? Why is it that just because I neglected to be nice to someone one day, just because I neglected to help someone one day, why is it that this neglect of good is so weighty that it costs me eternity? Why is it so seemingly disproportionate? Let me explain it like this. First, recall that Jesus deeply identifies with his people. What we do to one another, we do it to him. Understand that neglect is not just about you and me. Neglect is about you and Jesus. It's about the way that we treat him. That is why it's personal. And recall, not just that he personally identifies with each one of us, but that he is both judge and king. We are not neglecting a mere mortal. We're neglecting the creator. We're neglecting the person that we will answer to, whom we will stand before at the end of days to give an account of our lives. We are neglecting an infinitely worthy judge and king. Infinite offense requires infinite punishment. What we feel is disproportionate is actually very proportionate in a way that is incomprehensible to us. In the same way that you and I cannot understand infinity, you and I cannot comprehend how worthy Jesus is of our lives. Look, I think we sang it recently. Uh, and here I am to worship. It says, I'll never know how much it costs to see my sin upon that cross. We love that. We sing that bridge at least four times every sing that song. We love it. The thing is, what I'm saying right now is the flip side. It's the other side of the same coin. If you believe in the infinite worth of Jesus' sacrifice, then you also have to believe in the infinite worth of offense against him. If he is infinitely worthy to take all the sins of humanity on himself, then he is also infinitely worthy to judge. It is proportionate beyond our comprehension. Look, I'm not saying I like this idea but I am saying it is logical and it is biblical. In light of all this, beloved, make sure that you love your king by loving his people. Don't put Christian love on the back burner. Don't push it aside. Don't make it wait. Don't calculate it. Don't count it. Don't put it on the back burner because this is not something that you can afford to neglect. I want to challenge you to not wait till it's convenient for you to love one another. 
I want to challenge you to actually sacrifice to love one another. And start by opening your eyes to the people that God has given you right here in this room. I want to challenge you outside when you loiter and banter and stuff. Loiter with someone else for once. Talk to someone you don't normally talk to. Start there. Open your eyes to see the need. Open your heart. And go love. See the gravity of Jesus' words. See the gravity of discipleship. See what it means to be a Christian. Let's pray. God, we submit ourselves to you humbled because we know that you have called us to such a high calling. That what can be reduced to such simple words is in fact not simple at all. It will cost everything that we have. But we thank you for your generosity in understanding that we will never give more than what you have given for us. We will never sacrifice more than what you have sacrificed for us. And we don't deserve the eternity that you hold before us to reign with your son, to sit with him, to delight in him, to see him face to face. God, we don't deserve these things and you are so generous toward us. And we ask that in light of both your generosity and of your seriousness, help us to live well. Help us to live to your praise. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, uh, Minister Steele, for that sermon. Please rise as we respond with Build My Life.
Thank you, Minister Theo, for uh, preaching the word. Would you bow with me? Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all that we ask or think, according to the power at work within us, to him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus throughout all generations forever and ever. Amen. Thank you so much for worshiping alongside us this morning. Have a very blessed week. I look forward to worshiping with you again next week. Bye. I love you.